Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. Today, I'm gonna to be checking out a new metal vocalist for the first time who's been described as having both powerful and operatic vocals, in addition to being able to perform unclean and harsh vocals. I love that kind of diversity. Plus, a bunch of you have been recommending Killswitch Engage in both our YouTube comments and our live premiere chats. And you know that I love to follow your recommendations. So without further ado, let's get to it. All right. Well, Justin, this is the end of heartache. Oh. I mean, immediate first impression is that he does have an incredibly powerful sound. This is Howard Jones, by the way, specifically was looking for a video with his vocals because he was recommended to me a bunch. Even his speaking is incredibly powerful. And the way he's sustaining the note, continually feeding it power is impressive to me. I, I get why people may even think that that's operatic in nature. It does have a certain drama and drive in it. I'm gonna go back to the beginning here. This is taken from a longer concert. So right about here, I think is where we start. <laughs> I feel like if Dwayne The Rock Johnson were to sing in a metal band, he would sound something like this, right? It is, there is power behind it. Um, and there's also a, a lot of like pump you up kind of energy that's happening too. interesting plug they have on him. <laughs> so that distortion that he just did, the scream there, I think there's a fry scream. It, it was surprising to me by how high it was, the scream right away, or the coming down and then sliding down. Oh, it really... It really sounds almost like static in some ways. It's cool, it's a very, very cool sound. I think there's also some sort of um, production chain on his microphone that can uh, lean into that distortion as well. And it was so surprising after that really high fry scream that he dropped into this lower voice. Right? <laughs> it's just like, oh, wow. That the just the pitch range of those two is a really fun contrast to hear. One more time. <laughs> Whoa, scary.
his ability to sustain those lines is just really impressive. I like hearing a little vibrato enter sometimes as well. He sounds like he's very in control of when that comes in. And I'm really digging the audience involvement. Right? Ultimately, artists are there to serve an audience, to bring a message to them. And it's very clear that this band wants to engage with the audience in that way. And he in particular, right, he's up there and really looking at people in their faces and encouraging them with hands and words and microphone out, trying to get as much crowd involvement as he can. I appreciate that enormously. It's It shows, um, it shows a certain respect for the crowd and your audience and a desire to interact with them, which is really cool. <laughs> I think he's really good. And this is partly because even within both the clean singing and the harsh singing so far, I've heard a lot of control and a lot of variety. When he sings in his clean vocals, it's partly that he has control over vibrato as well. And he's able to add a little distortion or take it away or keep it totally clean. And he has a lot of depth in his sound, an ability to sustain a pitch for a long time as well with a lot of power. So this is telling me that his support system is really engaged. You'll notice uh, he tends to be standing with his legs further apart. This reminds me of what I sometimes like to refer to as Bruce Dickinson's horse stance. Uh, having your feet really solidly planted in the stage or on top of a monitor as might be what the case for him is on top of something here, I think. That can help that support stay really low so that you're able to execute some of those sustained lines um, with a little less breath pressure that is just pounding into your larynx, essentially. So I see him sustaining extremely, extremely well. And then when he's gone to harsh vocals, he's had highs and he's had some lower ones too at this point. He seems like he's got quite a few options so it's it's really it's fun to hear him and i also like the backing vocals here um i'm not sure i don't know that band member's name but um that was a nice surprise to get a little extra harmony <laughs> It's just such great switches back and forth from um, really fierce, harsh vocals to very powerful and uh, sustained, clean vocals, also deep in timbre. Um, I get why people are comparing him to opera because I hear that depth in the timbre as well and the power and the sustain. Those are things that I associate with opera too. So I think... That's a pretty cool comparison. I dig it. Yeah. 
the way he's slipping back and forth really quickly and when he flips into that clean sound, it's totally clean. I'm not hearing any remnants of um, distress on the true vocal folds. That tells me that he's doing his harsh vocals in a way that's very sustainable and healthy. Nice job. Uh, oh man, I wish I, let me see if I can find who this is. Um, this is gonna be either Adam or Joel. I know that both Adam and Joel sometimes perform backing vocals in Kill Switch Engage. I'm not sure which one this is, but he's doing a killer, killer job. I wanna go back a little bit here um, and talk about some of these details. <laughs> So these harsh vocals that he's making right now are happening uh, in the vocal tract much further up than where the pitch is created. Um, so the, they don't sound to me like they're made by the false folds either. And both the true vocal folds and the false folds, they tend to sit a little bit lower in that laryngeal anatomy. As you go up further, there are other things that can constrict and create distortion. So in this case, um, this sounds like it's more close to like the airy epiglottic folds, which is again higher up, or and it's kind of close to the epiglottis, which is that flap that um, really helps decide when you swallow to send stuff down your food tube instead of down your breath tube, essentially. <laughs> so, uh, but there's other things in that area that people will constrain. Um, sometimes there's like a retinoid cartilage rattling that can happen there. Um, it's sort of fascinating, actually, how many different pieces of anatomy there can be used to create some sort of uh, vibration, essentially like a second sound source that creates this distortion. So the one thing I would say that sounds very distinct to me is that it's being created higher in the vocal tract, so probably not as much on the false folds at this point, um, more like a fry scream essentially. And then he's shaping the, the resonance space after that to continually affect the pitch, which is more like a pitch area rather than a true note. There's like a pitch area that he can move up and down and he can shape his vocal tract in a way to affect that sound, which is really cool. So already, it, just in that little bit, you can hear how much control he's got. <laughs> Very high. <laughs> I dig, I really dig that that was handed over to a backing vocalist here. That was really cool. I think that it's important to mention the breath support that's needed for both harsh vocals and for clean vocals. Um, I've talked with quite a few people about this and how they're performing harsh vocals at this point. And it's, uh, I feel that some people think that they need more breath support or more breath energy to execute harsh vocals. And some people think, um, that it's it feels a little more relaxed. So I've, I've heard various things from artists saying, ah, oh, it feels this way or that way. Um, 
But one of the things that's interesting is some research has come out that looks like a little more breath pressure might be necessary to engage those harsh vocals. And similarly, for a more powerful sound, operatic sound, you also need that additional breath pressure. So to me, it almost sounds like he's taken some of that harsh vocal technique of that, again, grounded breath support and has brought that into his deeper, more powerful, clean vocal sound as well, which is really cool. Let's keep going. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Scary. I just realized that um, our backing vocalist also has a really cool cape, like very Dracula-esque, I really dig it. Okay, anyhow, yeah, cool cape, man. <laughs> tenderness at that part. I just want to comment on how, how lovely it was that I liked the way they brought the sound a lot further back down to bring in some variety and that he matched that in his timbre vocally too. Nice. Ooh. Is this the next song? No, it's the same song. That's the next song, okay. Oh man, I didn't catch that before I started going into the next song. So I'm gonna go back and listen to the ending of that one more time. I I was just ready for it to go on for longer. <laughs> If you listen to this last note, I was I really enjoy first of all the way that he takes it up and then sustains it for longer. But even does like a tiny, tiny bit of a slide off at the end, just like just very minuscule, and it makes it feel more impassioned to me. You hear that? That's cool. <laughs> that is a uh, very, very sudden end. Wait, wait was there, does it, do they play it twice? No. <laughs> Next song already. Man, I like the way that's a chopped ending there. It works really well in a concert format like this. Um, and we'll just have to wait for another time for the next song. I get it, and I agree. I think that there's something very reminiscent about opera, in his voice, it's the it's the power, the sustain, it's the way that he dips into his breath support to have that power throughout both the cleans and the harshes and the depth of timbre as well. There's a lot really going in his voice and he's able to create a lot of different colors and 
He's even able to have some tender moments in there. So very, very cool recommendation. Thank you to everyone. If you would like to compare Howard Jones's horse stance with Bruce Dickinson's horse stance, I suggest this playlist over here of some Iron Maiden, and I'll see you in another video soon. Thank you.